welcome to Property Matters here on Dublin South FM. You can contact the show on Twitter, Facebook or LinkedIn at iProperty Radio or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Your host for today is myself, Carol Tallon, and I'm delighted to be joined by Fergus Merriman, Chartered Building Surveyor. Fergus, you're very welcome. I've, I've wanted to have you on the show for a while um, and, and you and I have had conversations since the summer. And actually, the topics that we need to talk about have only expanded since then. So, Fergus, you're very welcome. Hi. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me on the show. No, delighted. Um, so, Fergus, today uh, you're a chartered building surveyor. So today I want to use the opportunity to get into some of the issues that are maybe mentioned briefly in the media and not fully understood um, and certainly not fully understood by me and, and by m many of our audience. In fact, one of the things we've seen is that across the industry, there can be assumption that people know more than they do. And generally, when you drill down into it, that's not necessarily the case. So today we want to tackle maybe some of the more, um, some of the bigger issues that are dominating the headlines. But let's start by, um, I suppose, introducing our audience to you. So. What, what, how long have you been a charter building surveyor? Well, I started uh, nearly 50 years ago uh, when I, as a young man, I walked into uh, a building surveyor's office for the first time under indentures um, where we, I had to pay for my training um, through, through an office and work hard at the same time. So it's quite remarkable how things have changed over 50 years, uh, incredibly so, actually. Um, when I look back at some of the things we tried to do then, um, you know, we wouldn't dream of it now. But, uh, you know, just in terms of communications, computers, uh, card drafting, um, all, all those sort of uh, technological changes, um, and also the way in which we finance the buildings as well, have changed dramatically. Um, um, well, actually, th that, that's definitely something that we want to discuss today because, I mean, that... that um, indenture the apprenticeship style i mean it's very similar to what the legal profession did as well where you were essentially not paid but paying um, for your training um so that meant possibly a less structured training um in terms of quality have we uh, the systems that we've put in place now that are more academic and less uh, on the job has that made things better or worse well, that's uh, that's very uh, pertinent indeed you know, a lot of uh, people who went through indentures and, and, and did that training um, back 50, 40 years ago, um, they had a very practical experience. So they understood deeply what actually happened on a building site. They, you know, and, and that goes throughout the whole of uh, the building sector. That, uh, that training was so deep because you actually understood you know, the physical demands of, you know, putting block on block or, um, you know, cranes and equipment and all that stuff that went on. Whereas the training we get now, um, it is, it is as you say, very academic. Um, it, it does limit people's understanding about what, what phys the physical demands of, of a building site actually are. Okay, and look, we, we will get kind of deeper into that, but um, talk us through maybe some of your career and the type of work you're involved in at the moment. Um, well, I started off, my, uh, my first project was uh, 250 houses, um, which needed to be uh, refurbished. They were uh, old terraced houses in the northeast of England. And, um, you know, they were, they were very... Uh, basic in, in terms of the way that they were. And our, my job was to design uh, kitchens and bathroom extensions on all these terraced houses. Um, you know, I mean, a very rudimentary work at that stage. Um, and then through the years, I've, I've worked on, on all sorts of things from airports to harbors, hotels, uh, town centers, uh, hospitals, um, industrial units, uh, you, you, you name it. I think I've I've just about covered every sector of the uh, the built environment over the years and worked for all sorts of different people from architects, from engineers, from developers, um, house builders, um, a lot of house builders actually, um, you know, and, and uh, over the years built up a wide understanding of the different aspects of, of the whole of the construction sector. Um, all of our different ideals and uh, aims and ambitions uh, to trying to achieve um, 
you know, basically brick on brick and achieve that built environment that we, we all we all need. Uh, Fergus, I came across um, I came across you through some commentary that you that you wrote into the Irish Independent. I think it was Origin. I know you featured in other publications as well. You've been one of the few outspoken people in the industry about some of the. Um, not just the challenges we have at the moment, but maybe the policies that have been taken to to address them. So let's start with maybe something that's really controversial at the moment. Any regular listeners or, or people who follow on our YouTube channel will see that I'm not in my usual surroundings. I'm in what looks like a very creepy cabin um, in the woods. Yes, there are some woods and yes, it is a cabin, but actually I'm in Donegal working for a few days and I'm actually overlooking some of the most beautiful beaches in Ireland. You know, it's one of the things I love about my work is that I get to travel right around Ireland um, and work for periods of time in places like this, which is amazing. But the, I mean, the sentiment in Donegal right now towards the, the building industry is really very negative um, in terms of the ongoing MICA scandal. But also what's emerging at the moment is that actually there will be difficulty in getting people to do the work even when agreements have been reached as to how that work will be compensated. So have you been involved, um, have you been involved, or I, I presume as a as a building surveyor, you've certainly been following it, but have you been involved in any of the cases ongoing at the moment? Uh, yeah, over the years, I, I do a lot of building inspections and pre-purchase inspections for, for on houses and, uh, and industrial units, all sorts of things. And I have um, recently identified more and more um, instances of uh, of mica and pirate um pirate movement um and that's just a function of the the quarry materials that we have in in ireland and uh the the difficulty in identifying these deleterious materials um at, at, the, at the at that early stage um and i suppose during the celtic tiger um, there was a, such a demand on the quarry industry to produce um, produce materials that uh, these things slip, slip through the gap. Now we've known about pyrite and, uh, and mica for you know probably all of my working life anyway. Right, but when I was doing some research, you know, I, I one of the things I saw was that where there is a vulnerability in a material like this, it's um, the, the Early wisdom was still to use it, but to supplement it with something that would strengthen it. Is that like is that what ought to happen? Well, um, first of all, you should you should avoid using materials which are going to cause problems. Um, that's that's a very basic uh, understanding about what we should be doing. Trying to militate by doing something. Um, adds complication, and wherever there's complication, there's room for error and mistake. And uh, that's exactly what we see: is that uh, you know, doing things in a complicated way adds to adds to more problems than uh, probably they should be there. Was this an industry failing or a legislative uh, or a policy failing? Um, I, I suspect probably both. Um, I, I, I think in the heel of the hunt uh, during the Celtic Tiger, we were we were building so much um, manpower was was dragged in from anywhere. Anybody that could do do a job was dragged in to do it, perhaps with less understanding than was necessary of the uh, of, of of the requirements. And of course, um, when those things were were um, flying along during the, during the building boom. Um, the the demand meant that uh, people were taking shortcuts because uh, you know they just needed to get on, you know, fire up the next load of uh, stone um, with perhaps less of the checks and balances that should have been there. Do you think that the assessment of uh, you know w there was quite a bit of time um, spent investigating instances of pyrite, and now in terms of Micah, do you think that um, we have a good handle on the scale of the issue, of the scale of the problem, or do you think this is something that is going to be revealing itself ongoing? Mm. Well, both pyrite and mica are, uh, are a slow burn. They, they do take a long time to, uh, to actually 
emanate uh, themselves as a, as a um, uh, um, you know a fundamental flaw in a building. Um, it, it particularly with pirate, this requires a triggering event where um, moisture is is hitting it in the right scale, and uh, that drying out and wetting process start the pyrite uh, expansion process to begin. And it's a bit like rust forming on a on a piece of steel. Um, you know, pyrite is actually iron, um, and it's in its basic. Uh, form. So when, when that uh, chemical reaction starts, it begins to expand, and that's what causes your cracking and you uh, start the, the building to crumble. And so you know, it'll take a long time before this all works out. Okay, but in terms of seeking redress for the cases that are known at the moment, um, you know, what is what is the industry position on this that you're aware of? Um. I think people are, are uh, keeping their head down at the moment as to how big the problem is and uh, how you know the, the the scale of it um, for the individual householders. It's an absolute disaster. Um, if you you bought a house in good faith and uh, you've done all your surveys, all your checks and balances in the in the purchasing um, end of it, there only to discover that uh, your your building is uh, in critical danger. Uh, in many cases, um, and in some cases, in, in danger of falling down. Um, so you're talking about a complete loss um, on which you probably have a mortgage, uh, you have a loan. Um, the stress involved for individual families is enormous. Um, but we haven't re really got a head around what we're going to do about it as, as a nation. And um, one of the things we've seen, uh, the are remediation works ever going to be sufficient here, or do all of these homes need to be demolished and rebuilt? Well, if you think about the building process, you know it's uh, it's incremental. So one load of blocks in the wrong place could mean that the entire building has to be demolished, or, or it could be that that particular floored load of blocks uh, um, is at a higher level, particularly with mica. Um, in uh, the pyrite instance where fill was used on the floors, um, then that's taking out the whole floor. So, I mean, it varies really from building to building. Every building is unique. And uh, so it just really depends on, on where you're seeing it. I mean, I, I've seen one building where just the gable end was affected because that's that's um, the end of the, of the building that's catching the weather. And therefore that's where the expansion started to happen. But um, in reality, Probably the whole building, all of that building is affected or will be affected over time. So where do you start and where do you stop? Right. And in terms of redress, um, look, as somebody not directly impacted by it, I don't even understand why this is an issue in debate. Obviously, these people who are heavily mortgaged for homes they can't live in should absolutely receive 100% redress. In fact, 100% almost isn't enough, in my opinion. But why, you know, where does the state start and the industry stop on this issue? Surely, you know, I, I you know, obviously I'm aware of um, building contractors that have gone bust since then and are no longer around, but surely that's not the case for all. And surely there's a greater point of responsibility in terms of the supply of those materials. Um, this is where insurance kicks in, you know, um, the majority of people with uh, mortgages will have insurance mm -hmm. and therefore it'll be the insurance companies that should be uh, standing up to the plate and, uh, and doing what they should do. And uh, obviously the, the enormity of this is, is such that the insurance companies are going, well, you know, we're not we're not sure how big this is going to be, but it's going to be it's going to be substantial. It's going to be a big hit on the insurance companies, whether they have the ability to um, fund and finance these replacements. We don't know yet. After that, then it's probably going to be down to government. But Fergus, are you referring to the homeowners insurance? Yes. Yeah. Why is it the homeowners insurance? Um, uh, when you have a mortgage, you have bricks and mortars insurance um, should be should uh, be taken out. Um, to protect the equity for the, the bank or the financial institution, and um, and that's the one that's that's saying, well, that's that's where the loss is. Right, but if, when we get to the point of accountability and responsibility, 
you know, where, how far can we go in terms of the supply and distribution of these materials? Well, after the statute of limitations of uh, seven years, it's very difficult to trace back and find out who actually was responsible originally. Um, even just tracking back to see which quarry supplied which stone and why, um, you know, it would be very hard to uh, to go through that process. I don't think it's absolutely impossible, but fundamentally, when you've gone through all that exercise, there uh, are you dealing with um, with with, with uh, as they would say in the legal terms of men of straw, uh, people who don't have the ability to actually um, fund or finance uh, the, the remediation works that would be, might be re needed. Um, you know, and, and if if a whole whole lot of this happened and uh, turned up on the door of say Roadstone, um, what are Roadstone going to do? Are they just going to go bust? Well, that's that's possibly that's the possibility. You know, that's that's what, what could happen. And this is what's creating so much worry for individual homeowners is, is to say, well, where are we going to get the money from? If the insurance company won't pay up, what, where are we going to go next? Yeah, you know, at, at the moment we're actually um, looking to see if we can innovate solutions for people while their homes are being replaced. So, um, uh, innovative innovative temporary housing that can be put on their sites connected to their ser services while their homes have been rebuilt because you know we've seen some really heartbreaking stories about families in small mobile homes and things like that that are just they're, they're not sustainable they're not suitable and they they just won't even um you know th that's even before all the financial issues in terms of um existing mortgages maintaining those redress when that's likely to be paid. Um, and even if that's straightforward, will they be able to find the labour they need locally to come in and build? You know, these are huge issues. That, you that see, you're already touching onto the, onto the point that, that, that we've got here is so why really fundamentally do we have this problem? And um, I, I kind of realised maybe over 30 years ago that the, the building sector is... Um, it consists of a large number of different entities all pulling in different directions, trying to do something which historically we believe was the right thing to do. And, and, the, and the industry has grown over many, many years on the basis of traditional uh, methods of construction. Um, and we've changed the dynamic and speed and pace in which we've tried to use those traditional skills um, methods, materials, all those things which come together to try and create uh, a building today. Um, but if you do a comparison with something like the, uh, the motor industry and you look at the speed of change that they have and the innovation and the methodologies in which they employ to achieve best results, just even talking about electric vehicles now, the speed in which they've made that, that sea change to go from, from petrol or diesel and internal combustion engines to electric um, cars, you know, it, it's, it's amazing how they, they've done that so fast. But if you ask the construction industry if they would try to do that, It'd be virtually impossible because there are so many different entities all pulling in different directions, trying to do their own thing and trying to make money. And if we think about replacing those homes in the same method, we are probably going to end up with similar sorts of problems. I mean, I, I survey uh, a large number of houses and I'd say I seldom go into one, you know, maybe one in a hundred that doesn't have some problem somewhere. And that's because of the methodology that we employ for building. Um, differently from the, uh, from the car industry, every site is unique. Every, every house is sitting on its own unique site. But that's the only part of uniqueness about it. Um, if you were to think, I've said this <laughs> quite, quite a few times, but if you were to order a new car, and um, Ford or whoever it was turned up uh, outside your house with, a, with a, a group of vans and lorries and different people with, you know, different different parts and started to assemble your car on your drive in the rain. Number one, you wouldn't be able to afford it. And number two, uh, you wouldn't accept it and you wouldn't dare drive it either. 
But essentially, that's what we're doing with our houses. We're, 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 we're saying we're, a whole lot of people are going to come, all with different sets of skills, all with different ideas, often who haven't worked before, would work together before, um, and trying to achieve a perfect result every time. It, it, you know, it's, it's a big ask to do. Um, so if we, if we draw from the, the proper industries where they, they're in full control of the product they're trying to uh, provide and they have all the checks and balances in there, they have the supply chain control to be able to say to the, the suppliers, you know, I want X number of, of this particular product and that's the price I'm prepared to pay. That doesn't happen in the construction industry because you've got to go down to your builder's merchant and negotiate um, with your builder's merchant where, where you are. And it's only the big um, contractors who can um, have any leverage on their supply chain, um, whereas the majority of uh, small builders around the country don't have that power. And therefore, we can see how that's where costs are going to go. And that's where mistakes come in because the builder's merchant is going to say, well, I actually don't have that particular product, but I have something very similar here. And uh, if you go back to the uh, to the the, the pirate uh, debacle, um, if one quarry doesn't have exactly what you want, and you're under pressure to build, and you've got to get your uh, your building up and built uh, in, in quick time, you're going to accept second best, um, and that's just the nature of the way the the, the construction sector has worked over the years. And uh, we have a lot of built in ideals about what we're expecting our homes to be built of um you know and so so if you're looking at that couple or, or that, that family where their house is starting to crumble and you're saying to them well actually what we're going to do is replace it with something very similar um are you really giving them the content the competence they need or are you going to say actually there's a factory down the road and they're going to make a new home for you and it'll be up uh, and we'll have it built in a few weeks um which one would you would you accept? Yeah, um, Fergus, you're after touching on about ten different things there that I want to unpack with you because you know <laughs> initially, actually, we hadn't scheduled this conversation to talk about Micah. It's the, just the fact that I'm in Donegal. It's all anybody here is is talking about, um, and it's it's heartbreaking. The consequences are heartbreaking. But you touch on something really important, and that is this transition that the industry has started to embark on going from traditional to uh, modern methods of construction. You know, you talk about that assembly line and I think it's a good analogy to take it to the car manufacturers because actually that's one of the first things that was done when, uh, you know, going back two or three decades when lean methodologies were introduced to the construction industry. It was done uh, coming straight from the Toyota from the Toyota um, assembly line, so I think that's something that the industry can relate to as an analogy. Um, but in terms of in terms of uh, moving to to whether it's offsite construction or other uh, modern methods of construction, you know, you you touched on something really important there, and that is leveraging the supply chain. In terms of uh, adoption of of MMC or modern methods of construction, you know, the, it, it requires a different type of, or leveraging a different type of uh, supply chain. And that's just not well built out in Ireland. So even if we wanted to transition to MMC, could we? Um, very difficult because um, our, our labour force uh, is, is scattered around and generally needs to be proximate to where the end result is going to be. Which, so if you've got a site somewhere in Donegal and um, the factory might be in, you know, um, in Dublin, uh, you know, where is the local uh, workforce, uh, you know, where are people going to be employed? In, uh, in Donegal. Uh, and at the moment, um, the construction sector is saying, well, um, we're building out of blocks and we've concrete and we've timber and joiners and all those local people employed. Um, that, that's that's a, a difficult Rubicon to cross because uh, what, what is, how is your, your labor force going to be provided for? Um, you know, if, you, if we transition to MMC, um, I suppose that uh, the way in which you look at employment in the construction sector has been a big problem for many years. 
and that's impacting now on on young people who are looking at the at the sector and saying, well, why would I go and work uh, in in this particular sector where um, we we don't have surety of employment? Um, we've got to go to a different place every week, and you know and work outside in the in the, in the lashing rain it, it's uh you know it, it's kind of morally um responsible ra- moral responsibility really uh from the state's perspective is yes we want to give people jobs but really do we want to be giving them jobs where their uh, physical ability to do that job is kind of curtailed by the time they get to 50 you know so there are a whole host of different um uh you know pushes and pulls uh, about about the decision making to this but i think we you know we have to start to begin to to lead from a better place and um the way we do that is the same and that analogy of the the, the motor industry could kicks up again um you know the public have a choice to say well do we buy a you know a, a fiat or a ferrari and that's that's based on you know their, their their need, their ability to pay for it, and 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 so on. And we 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 haven't really got there in in, in the construction sector, other than we build a, a state of uh, four bedroom houses here, or a, or a socially affordable state of two bedroom houses down the road. You know that's uh, uh, that's that's not that's that's the cart leading the you know leading the horse. See that, but that sounds like a perception issue because I remember, you know, maybe 15 years ago when I was working as a buyer's agent sourcing property all over the country. And I remember one instance where, well, actually it happened on more than one occasion, but one particular one where um, I was helping a young woman buy um, her first home after she returned to Ireland and her father advised her not to buy it because it was of timber frame construction. It wasn't block built. And that was something I heard quite a lot 15 years ago, because maybe particularly not from the generation who were buying, but from their parents who were advising them. They didn't like the idea of timber frame construction or construction. And now we're getting into um, offsite manufacturing, whether it's panelized or volumetric, where you have pods being delivered, you know, where you've got... Uh, apartments being built in two sections on factory floors across the Midlands. Um, And we know from a logical point of view, and I think the industry has been very vocal in saying, well, this is how we achieve certainty of programme. This is how we achieve consistent quality. This is how we um, can can hire and maintain a local workforce uh, consistently and how we can guarantee consistent output. But, ha- you know, have consumers come around to this idea of uh, prefabrication, even though it's the least popular word to use in this industry? Well, yeah, perception is, uh, is an interesting one. Very few people go and buy a Trabant, uh, you know, and that's perceptive. You know, um, they're probably a very good car. I, I wouldn't really know. I've never, never driven one. But there's a sort of uh, a perception out there that a Trabant might not be a very good idea, um, and and therefore it's fear of the unknown. Um, and that's what I mean about leading from the front is that the um, the offsite construction sector really needs to begin to to lead from the front um, and start to impact um, the economies of scale. Um, cost, quality, uh, all, all of those things um, to uh, change that perception. Um, and that perception can be really my experience is that off-site construction tends to be much better quality. Uh, it has all the checks and balances of uh, quality assurance uh, in one place. Um, so you don't have a building inspector who has gone off to uh, look at uh, houses in different places, not really understanding different uh, uh, levels of construction, different qualities, different abilities, um, and uh, different stages that they're looking at in different houses going on uh, or different apartments. Um, whereas if they're going to uh, a factory environment, um, they're seeing the same thing on a production line there, and they can check the process all the way through and see where the possibilities of failure uh, might lie. And um, what 
promoted in the industry now is that uh, in the offside industry is that uh, um, each each uh, element of uh, prefabricated uh, construction has a, a passport. Um, and that passport contains all of the provenance of materials, so you know exactly where they come from. And you're avoiding this problem that you're talking about with pyrite and mica, um, because that provenance is uh, locked into this passport that you have with your house. So it's a little bit like getting a car, and you know um, when you when you pick up the manual. Uh, that somebody uh, in, of experience and understanding has checked this all the way through and it's been tested and uh, taken to the extremes um, more rigorously than probably you're ever going to drive it. And that uh, analogy should really follow into the off-site uh, industry where they start to lead from the front. Um, so that, that perception well, that negative perception disappears because people will, will aspire to having something which is much better. 93.9, Dublin South FM. What are some of the practical things? Um, you know, you refer to leading from the front. What are some of the practical things that this entails? You know, is it a case that um, uh, mortgage companies need to be comfortable with this? Is it a case that insurers need to be comfortable? Um, development funders, do they need to be comfortable? What does leading from the front look like from where we are? Well, this is exactly what I mean about the the, uh, the construction sector is a sector and it's a sector of all these different elements. So all who have their own um, their, their own end game to, uh, to work towards. And... Uh, with perhaps less understanding about how these things all, all come together. So uh, at the moment, the um, the offside sector is nascent. It's it ha- it's not mature at all. It hasn't really crossed many of these barriers. The uh, timber frame uh, sector did attempt to do this um, during the during the the boom, and um, unfortunately. Um, you know, I suppose what happened there was that uh, uh, certain individuals could see that uh, this looked like a very simple way of construction and tried to do it and failed. And that um, created a negative uh, perception that perhaps you, you were alluded to before. Um, what we're talking about in, in the, in the offsite um, sector now is that. Uh, we, we actually have um, such a good product that um, and such a, a set of controls that uh, you wouldn't think about going to try and build this in in, in your garage. You're you're actually looking at um, uh, a prefabricated methodology that uh, is so good that um, it, it can't be challenged, and we've re- we really haven't got to that point yet. And what will gradually happen as the industry starts to mature is that all of those economies of scale, of production, of uh, efficiency that will follow through um, haven't quite got there. At the moment, what's happening is to uh, recoup the investment uh, required in in getting uh, to that point. Um, They're looking at what house prices are and they're matching them. uh, therefore, they're, they're uh, recouping their, their investment um, as rapidly as you possibly can. As that begins to mature, what we'll see is that uh, the investment will start to pay for itself, and then you'll start to see the offerings of off-site manufactured houses um, start to fall in price. And uh, then, then it's really game on at that point. Um, given the size of Ireland and our estimated, even our you know, the highest levels of our estimated demand. Is the market large enough to be able to achieve the economies of scale needed to bring the investment in for these facilities? Um, absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, how many, uh, if you look at the number of house builders around the country and look at their scale of performance, um, that they might be building anywhere from, you know, five, six, seven houses a year up to maybe a hundred. Um, whereas an off-site manufacturer is going to be producing at least a thousand houses a year, um, you know, that as a as a minimum, and um, you know, running through through one factory, and the capability is certainly there to be able to do that. Um, so that's when the economies of scale kick in. 
um, if, if you're a small builder building, you know, 10 houses a year, you don't have the leverage uh, needed to be able to uh, get the efficiency uh, of, of supply, um, con continuity of labor force and so on. It becomes very difficult to do to do that. Yeah. Um, there will still there will still be the place for those those still builders. They will still have uh, opportunities to build and uh, and and you know create the built environment um, because there will be still a lot of you know a, a housing stock is is huge and they still need to be maintained and extended and all those things in in a traditional way. Um, but we're looking at volume houses. Um, uh, you know, really um, overcoming the shortfall of houses that we have at the moment, and we can't do it with the um, the current traditional building um, methods that we have. Really, we, we just don't have the manpower, we don't have the materials, we don't have the 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 speed. I mean, if you think how uh, average time to build a house is six months, um, and just start to do the maths on that, and then you realise. The amount of uh, labour force and uh, the time it will take to, uh, um, you know, build those thirty thousand houses that that uh, the government are talking about. Um, would that bring you up two issues? Uh, then, yeah, the existing labour that we have, um, even though it's not enough, will need to be retrained in more modern methods of construction, whichever whichever of the the brackets or the buckets that the, the, the build falls into. But also in terms of, you mentioned earlier, leveraging uh, the supply chain. We've seen in Ireland a trend similar to what we saw across the UK, which are larger developers who are embracing, um, or larger contractors who are embracing modern methods of construction, acquiring the providers of these, so acquiring the facilities. Um, is that positive or negative? Is that stunting growth by essentially keeping it within um, a, a smaller number of organizations you know is that helping or hindering the progress well like any maturing industry you you will see um you know uh, uh, that the, they will gravitate towards uh, a smaller number of more efficient larger uh, operations and uh, that's really what's going to happen in in uh, the construction sector is that um, we see the likes of the, of the of the big contractors. I won't mention any names, but um, are already acquiring um, those manufacturing facilities um, because uh, they can they can see the future and they can see the future that they you know trying to um, build masonry construction in the rain is really not a very good idea. Um, and you certainly don't get the speed and efficiency and the quality um, that you can do when you're undercover in a factory. Okay, you know. um, that, that makes sense. But let's let's go back to the figures because just this morning, the SESI, uh, and I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at it, as far as I know, it was only published this morning, but they published a report showing that um, tender values have doubled since since COVID. Yeah. Uh, double. Yeah. So that's, Doubles. you know, that's... Doubles, yeah. And yet, over the past number of over the past number of weeks, we've been reporting on building providers who have exceeded in terms of profit targets and things like that. And I'm trying to reconcile this with an opinion piece you wrote earlier this summer, um, um, proposing for um, off-site manufactured homes to be delivered for 150,000. Like all in all, the the figures. Um, it, it's mind-boggling. I don't know how to make sense of it, and I don't know how anybody outside of the industry makes sense of it. You know, how are uh, materials, material costs increasing, uh, tender values doubling, um, and then we've got building providers who are increasing their profits. So something's not aligning here. And, uh, you know, and then if using modern methods of construction, there's a there's the possibility to deliver homes for 150,000. Why are they taking 350,000? So, um, can you can you unravel any of that for me? Well, I think I said it uh, earlier on is that this is a the construction sector is a, a group of uh, um, different organisations all pulling in different directions for different different reasons and. Certainly, the response to the global increase in material prices um, that's resulted from COVID um, 
really uh, has been uh, taken advantage of by by lots of different people in different ways. Um, I don't think that uh, you know everybody's reacting to what they feel they should be doing um, in these circumstances because uh, we are on in unknown territory and uh, if you can uh, you know keep a war chest there by increasing your prices uh, then you're probably uh, fitter to be able to survive whatever's going to happen next um, i suspect that um that 150 grand house that we we i, I spoke about uh, a year ago now um is possibly not achievable just in terms of the materials, uh, material costs. Um, if we just take steel, for instance, um, 30 years ago, uh, steel was around about a thousand punts uh, for, a, for a ton. And uh, before COVID, it was about 750 euros a ton. So it, over 30 years, the, 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 the uh, material steel has gone down dramatically in price and it's only in the last six to eight months that uh it has risen back up and i think we're talking about two thousand a ton now you know so it's it it has risen dramatically but in the longer term it it really has just bounced back to um the natural inflation uh, price you know so if you look if you're talking about the materials alone um, in terms of the numbers uh, that you put against it in finance, um, that's not really, um, you know, it's a misperception really. Is it the price of materials that's gone up or is it the value of money that's gone down? And I suspect that there's a bit of both. Okay. Um, and I look, I, I do, I, I understand that um, something I'm trying to get my head around is, you know, we're also trying to factor in, obviously, um, more sustainable methods of construction. And um, in terms of, you mentioned steel, you know, light gauge steel framing, you know, steel is positioned as one of the more sustainable solutions because it can be recycled and recyclable. Um, uh, but I'm conscious that Ireland being an island nation, we're dependent on imports quite a lot um, for everything it should be except timber. And then Irish timber in terms of output has been just falling off a cliff for the last number um, of years. So, what so, I, I mean, I mean Quincha have uh, certainly uh, sufficient timber uh, standing in forests around the country to, to be able to provide all of our housing needs if we had um, an industry that could avail of that material. Um, but we don't, and uh, also the perceptions that you, uh, you you talked about as a uh, a bit of a, a drag on on perhaps doing that. But certainly that we do have the resources there. Uh, if you take a, take the volume of materials that you need um, in terms of sustainability, um, you're, you're talking about probably forty tons of concrete um, in in a house, whereas you're talking uh, talking about maybe uh, two tons of steel. Um, so when you're looking at sustainability, you're saying, well, can you recycle that 40 tons of concrete? Well, there's a difficulty there. Um, the um, uh, Part D of the building regulations would predicate against recycling concrete. Um, but remanufacturing, which is what steel would, would uh, be classed under, is perfectly achievable. Um, and you're, you're remanufacturing a very small amount of material compared to a very large amount of uh, non-recyclable. So that's where sustainability really has to be think about. And it's it's not you know we're talking about uh, reuse or, um, or or recycle, and uh, they're fundamentally different things. Okay, and look in terms of <coughs> um, if we're going to have a conversation about reuse in the industry, it should be actually using the underutilized or unused stock in our you know I. I it's one of the greatest truisms that, you know, the most efficient building is the one that's already standing. And we have so many of those in Ireland. Um, we've recently, earlier this summer, we opened an office in Galway, um, out actually in Connemara, in Cahiro. And um, the, 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 there, there's two empty houses for every occupied house out there. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not ones that could be brought back into use with 30,000 as the government is proposing, you know, for first time buyers or for home buyers, you know, th these would require 
more than 30,000, but I'm not talking about, you know, 200 year old stones of cottages. I'm talking about uh, farmhouses that haven't been occupied in 20 or 30 years, but originally had electricity and other services, though maybe not um, septic tanks. So I, I suppose the, the sustainability conversation, we haven't really, we haven't gotten to grips on how best to use our existing stock. That, and I don't just mean vacant, but vacant, derelict, underused. We're not, we just aren't good at efficiently using our built environment. Well, we're not. And I'd say 50% of the farms around the country have some uh, form of habitation or, or, or previous habitation on them uh, that certainly could be brought back into, into use. Um, if the planning hasn't gone in to demolish them, then it's still essentially, uh, if it has some vestige of a, of a roof on it, it's still basically classed as being um, a habitation. Um, you know, now there will be some planning required to bring them back into use, but relatively little. And I think the, um, the, 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 the sea change we've got in, in working methods um, for many people around the country has been a big wake up call to, well, maybe we should move back down the country and uh, show, show the, the, the parents have an old place we can do that up. And uh, if we look at the, the um, estate ages around the country, you'll see that they're the amount of stock that they've got has fallen dramatically um, over the last two years when you've seen the, these uh, these places being, being bought. Um, there is a great lack of understanding about how um, uh, effectively you can do up these houses. Um, and certainly um, I've seen uh, great examples of uh, houses you wouldn't look at twice, you know, with a tree growing out of them, that uh, you think, well, that's, that's impossible. You couldn't do that. But um, with the right understanding, the right training, the right people, you can actually do that and uh, bring them up to a good standard um, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, good occupational standard. I'm so, got, I'm so happy to hear you say that, Fergus, because I'm, 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 I'm at the early stages of such a project myself. So um, I, I'm really happy to hear you say that. But I, I'm conscious that we're running short on time um, but before we finish up, one thing I wanted to address with you as well, which was actually, I'm pretty sure, supposed to be the basis of this whole conversation, and that is rural planning. So so in terms of rural planning, there is ambiguity out there. You know, you've touched on it there about people returning to perhaps their their home country or counties or their, their home counties of their parents or family members. Um, not all will be able to find, because actually in terms of, rooms that are classed uh, or that have a roof um you know I, as you said they're actually selling quite quickly now at the moment in terms of planning um rural planning for one-off homes we know what the general um the Na national development plan really doesn't want much of that we get that but in terms of the rules for one-off rural homes there's there's real uncertainty in terms of the direction that's been given from europe and how that's been interpreted by local authorities around the country. What's the position? It is another example of the, the different elements in the in the, the, the property sector pulling in different directions. <laughs> the um, if you if you think about the uh, the cost of infrastructure that you that the, the the government might be putting in or the county councils might be putting into villages, you know, in terms of water and sewage and transport and roads and hospitals and all those good things that we need, um, it, it's it it weighs against that to just go scattering houses all over the countryside um, and uh, spreading them out because it it. it detracts from the viability of that investment you've made in the in the infrastructure so i can completely understand why uh, policy perhaps needs to change um, and on the other hand you've got uh, every farmer in the country saying well actually um, the value of my farm is going down because i don't have that road frontage anymore but road frontage um, from a, a social perspective is 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 kind of a negativity as well um, uh, not just the the, uh, the infrastructure side of it there, but from uh, social cohesion, um, you know, and uh, 
this morning I was, I was driving down the road there and I was looking at all these houses where the, uh, the the families are loading the kids into the car and they'll drive past each other to go to go to the village and uh, they'll drive past each other on the way back uh, tonight after collecting the kids from school and um, the chances of social interaction uh, uh, spread out along a, a long road um, are, are much reduced so um you know, I, I think we, we, we really do need, do need a mature conversation about why we're changing, how we're changing, and what really is is best for the long-term uh, future of the country. Uh, and that's what planning is about. The planning is about thinking about the future. It's it's not about the individual needs of, uh, you know, somebody who happens to have a nice field and wouldn't it be great to build a house on it. It's about the overall viability of the country. Fergus, has urban pl- or has planning not turned into urban planning? Um, and are we trying to? And uh, by the way, I, I understand best practices in urban planning, you know, are to have a greater concentration. Um, however, you have to, you know, one, I'm in the field of communications. One of the great rules about communications is that you meet people where they're at. So, um, to, applying that rule to planning in Ireland, meet people where we're at. We are still a nation that is primarily within two generations from the land. Yes. How are we making this transition too quickly? Um, I think I think this this uh, you know the longest journey starts with the first step, and we've got to take that first step. We really we really have to. You see, I mean, the the perception for so many years has been that uh, the countryside has been um, a, a resource for. Uh, young people uh, to uh, emigrate and and and, uh, and leave, and uh, it's a bit of a shock to discover that the young people actually want to come back. And uh, how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to provide for them? How are we going to pro- you know have adequate housing and resources and schools and all those things they they'll need to to come back? So we haven't really grasped that yet. But do you think you know? that because we're positioning it exactly as you've said, people coming back, what do they need? What do they need? What do they need? What do they bring? What do they bring with them? Um, now, with rural broadband, there's the ability to work uh, to work remotely, as I'm doing from literally a cabin. This is a this place is called the Roundhouse. It's literally a cabin in a hill overlooking a beach in Donegal, um, and I have obviously um, hot. Well, uh, by the way, this is an Airbnb. I'm only here for a few days while I'm working, but you know, I, I'm able to. Uh, host a radio show in Dublin. I'm able to run my business that has offices in Dublin and Galway, all from this little round cabin in mm-hmm. the middle of nowhere. Now, I, so I absolutely get the unsustainability um, in the long term of rolling out something like that. But the reality is we still have people who choose a different way and they can contribute in terms of tax payment. Um, so it's not always about people coming back and people building in the country what do they need what are they going to take what do they bring in terms of resources because the reality is even though I run a contemporary communications agency primarily in Dublin I still spend my time on the road traveling to rural areas like this and when I work I work consistently with a chihuahua on my knee and animals at my feet and coming up to the window and things like that irrespective of where I am in the country I, it is too much. I would never thrive in an urban setting. Um, it is too much to expect that everybody's ready to go there. We There's generations before we get to that. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you go back uh, BC before COVID, um, you know, the idea of doing what you're doing would be unthinkable. Um but if you go back even further and you go back 30 years and think you were driving around the countryside trying to find something to eat, get a sandwich, you know, um, you know, it was virtually impossible. What changed? Well, what changed was really uh, Europe joining the, joining the European community and the ability for that flow of people with different ideas, with under, different understandings, more vitality, um, uh, you know, all, all those things have changed. And, and that fluidity of uh, people moving around is good for everyone. 
uh, it, it certainly it certainly helped us in Ireland. Um, just thinking about uh, the number of uh, what, what I don't like the term, but foreign nationals as they as they, they they're termed by government. Um, you know, th those people coming into the country have created huge amount of vitality. We see coffee shops. We have, you know, people making, you know, bread and, and so on in the villages and so on. And, you know, people like yourselves who are journalists, we're filmmakers, we're, you know, all sorts of different people living in my little community here um, that have, that have, wouldn't, wouldn't have been here 30 years ago. And that's, that's really, that's about the long-term sustainability of, uh, of, of our society. Yeah, but it, it, that runs almost counter to this idea that we need to be in a, um, a, even a village or town center in order to create a society. I just don't, I just don't buy that. And I, well, you see, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking about, about that, that, that's part of the misperception of what, of what, what Europe is saying. Yeah. Europe isn't saying you, you can't just scatter houses all over the country. What it's, what it's saying is that you need to think very strategically about the way in which you plan uh, for this and allowing a house in the corner of every field isn't necessarily the best way. What they're suggesting is that more like perhaps rural France or rural Germany, that you have clusters um, and then you're interspersed with countryside. And so those clusters can can work together as little communities that still have all the advantages of being rural. Yeah. Um, but have the advantages of the infrastructure of the bus that's going to come, you know, uh, people there that, you know, and, and that's uh, that little economy that's created there um, means that you can step out of the door, you can go down the street and have a cup of coffee and a sandwich, and that's creating a little local job there. Um, rather than having a, a lorry a lorry come from the nearest city and deliver, deliver your bread every day. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, by the way, just in terms of the rural planning, uh, my reference to Europe there was actually in relation to, um, at the moment, um, many local authorities still have this uh, local needs, but how they interpret local needs, it's not about people who have intrinsic links to the community. At the moment, they have actually local authorities asking for baptismal certs. Now, that goes far beyond local needs. Um, I mean, that goes right into the the secular side, um, a, a, that's a conversation for another day. But actually, uh, we know that uh, the EU direction has been really clear on this, that there needs to be equality for free movement of people. So uh, local authorities ought not to be looking for baptismal certs um, when they're assessing the, the intrinsic local value or the, the local links to, uh, to um, that people have when in terms of planning you know that's the that's one of the areas of uncertainty that is being interpreted differently depending on which local authority you speak to yeah i, I agree i mean that's that's uh, that i wouldn't agree with that, that policy at all of asking for anybody's um you know personal um details to that extent um proving local needs as a, do i have a job uh, do i know people here uh you know, is uh, uh, there is a requirement that I'm not going to have to travel, you know, uh, a huge amount of distance every morning? And uh, what is the the planning impact of 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 my residence in in this particular place? Um, it, you know, it, so the, the, there are much more fundamental ways of of uh, analysing that rather than asking for somebody's birth cert. Yeah, listen, I, I, com I completely agree. We're just waiting for the message to filter down. Unfortunately, the Department of Housing has not been for, very forthright in um, agreeing and adopting with the EU direction um, or communicating that out. And it was something that actually we did expect to see um, a little bit more clarity under the Housing for All, which we didn't even get to touch on today. Fergus, I could speak to you all day because, you know, th th there are so many things that we need to explore and get a deeper understanding before we can even, you know, before we can start to address any issue, we need to understand them. And I think there's such a lack of understanding on my own part and, and broadly on what the issues are. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today and being so generous with your time. And um, that's it from us this week. You can listen to Property Matters on Dublin South FM or get in touch by, um, by emailing the show at hello at iPropertyRadio.com or on social media at iPropertyRadio. Thanks to Peter Rice on sound, from myself, Carol Talon, and all the team here. Stay safe.